So, welcome everyone to the second day of the, of the workshop. So, our first speaker is uh, Ran Lemon. Uh, we'll be talking about streams and dynamics from an bootstrap. So, um, Ran has like to do that. All right, sounds good. Thanks very much. Uh, well, thanks to the organizers uh, for the uh, invitation to speak here and for what's been a fantastic workshop so far. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, this set of three papers focusing mostly on the latest one, where we are uh, trying ambitiously to uh, essentially derive string amplitudes from first principles. Uh, and what I mean is we're using the bootstrap method. So the bootstrap method is, of course, rightly celebrated as essentially a means of discovering new physics without using high-minded principles of geometry and thought experiments, but instead asking the right math question of the S matrix. And so you can, of course, get essentially for free gauge theory, uh, GR, et cetera, uh, in this way. But what hasn't been answered is what is the analog for string theory? What is the math question to which string amplitudes are the answer? And of course, we're interested in this because it would be desirable to, in some sense, prove that string theory is, uh, is unique. And so we should ask ourselves, what is it that uh, string amplitudes do? Uh, the, you know, the slogan is that they unify GR and quantum field theory by taming transplankian singularities of graviton amplitudes. But more pragmatically, string theory accomplishes this by adding uh, an infinite tower of massive higher spin degrees of freedom. Uh, now, you know, of course, in QFT, the thing about a massive higher spin degrees of freedom is you can't add just one. Uh, if you add one of them, they generically make your amplitudes worse because of powers of momenta in the propagator numerator. So string theory uh, solves this issue by adding an infinite tower where they kind of telescope and cancel uh, each other's divergences. But an interesting question is whether or not uh, string amplitudes are the only consistent way of adding an infinite tower of massive higher spin degrees of freedom. So in particular, we'll be looking at uh, Veneziano's uh, famous amplitude from 1968 and asking how unique it is. And of course, this being a conference on QCD and uh, the QCD string, uh, this amplitude has its origins in the prehistory of uh, QCD uh, before uh, David's discovery of asymptotic freedom. And it was, of course, constructed to uh, solve a basically a phenomenological puzzle of the late 60s. Uh, perturbative methods seemed at the time potentially impractical. And so there was this S, S matrix program of trying to write down an amplitude sort of ab initio that would, uh, that would match the observed Reggie trajectories seen in the meson spectra. So here we have a, an old plot, uh, a Chu Frauchi plot showing mass squared versus angular momentum. And of course, everything is lining up on a line. And we understand this now in terms of the QCD string. Uh, another uh, aspect that Veneziano was trying to capture was uh, this sense of dual resonance, the sense that really you should only be adding uh, states in one channel and that they'll magically resum into states in the other channel. So don't add both S and T channel particles, add just one, but an infinite tower so that the propagators will resum into the infinite tower of spins. So what we're essentially asking uh, in this talk is, what is the set of dual resonant functions? Is there life beyond uh, Veneziano? And so what we're going to do is derive four-point amplitudes. Uh, we'll imagine that the external states are just scalars, so I'll strip off the polarization data. And we'll be asking ourselves whether we can get the amplitudes, that is the dynamics, just given some minimal data in the form of the spectrum. So just giving ourselves the M squareds and the angular momenta, along with a few physical constraints. So the physical constraints are crossing, polynomial residues, and high energy boundedness. Uh, and we'll indeed find uh, that the distinctive form, the gamma gamma over gamma of string theory arises very naturally. So we'll understand sort of why that uh, was in a sense inevitable. But we'll find some interesting generalizations, in fact, an infinite space of new objects that accomplish uh, many of the same mathematical miracles. And it would be interesting if uh, these new objects have some uh, use either in a formal aspect of string theory or even uh, phenomenologically. So by crossing, um, I want to think about colored scalars. So uh, these will be color stripped amplitudes. So uh, we just have cyclic invariants. So we just have uh, S and T swap symmetry among the Mendel stamps. 
Uh, we can talk about fully both symmetric amplitudes if we want to do this for gravity. Uh, that'll probably, probably have to be in the coffee break. I don't think I'll get to gravity in this talk. But you can just think of this as kind of gauge theory amplitudes with the polarizations stripped off. Polynomial residues. Uh, so for this requirement, we want the nth uh, exchange state to have spins running from zero to n, uh, just like string theory. We're just going to put this in by fiat. And what it means is that the, the residues uh, of the amplitude on the nth uh, exchange state are polynomials in T uh, of degree n. Uh, we can think about more general polynomials. In fact, we thought about this uh, in uh, a paper from last October, but I'll, I'll leave that aside for this talk because it, it turns out to be really interesting even in this uh, space of uh, just spin from zero to n. Uh, Non-polynomial residues are also um, of interest in the context of the EFT hedron, uh, but again, we'll, we'll leave that aside for this talk and take kind of a hard line view of locality in the sense of just wanting polynomial residues. Finally, um, high energy boundedness. So what we want is for the amplitude to vanish in the Reggie limit. So fix T large S, we want the amplitude to go to zero. Um, that sounds maybe like uh, an intensive requirement, but remember if you dress this with uh, the F to the fourth polarization data, this is literally just Reggie boundedness. It's requiring that the amplitude scale like uh, S to the J at, uh, at large S. So what this means is that there's no pole at infinity so we can rewrite the amplitude in terms of its own uh, zero subtracted dispersion relation. So I can rewrite it uh, in terms of uh, just the imaginary part of the amplitude integrated over the real S axis. And if I now input one further assumption, which is that I just have a bunch of tree level exchanges, I get for free dual resonance. So here uh, I have derived dual resonance, not assumed it, just derived it again from assuming crossing symmetry, high energy boundedness, and uh, no pole at infinity, or equivalently uh, well-tamed UV behavior of the amplitude. So it will be this uh, requirement that we want to impose and see what are the allowed polynomials, what are the allowed R sub ends, uh, such that this resums into a dual resonant object. And of course, this is famously one of the hallmarks of uh, string amplitudes that differentiates them from field theory, and it's clear in string theory why you have dual resonance just at the level of a cartoon, and that you can uh, deform an S channel a string world sheet into a T channel one by just sort of squishing it. Right, so now uh, let's input a spectrum and see what we get. So first we're going to, uh, again, inspired by whether, whether you like either inspired by string theory or inspired by the data from uh, the mid 60s, we'll input an integer spectrum, m squared equals n. So now we have, we have a two variable complex analysis problem uh, in order to implement crossing symmetry. And to zeroth order, nobody really likes multivariable complex analysis. So we'll turn it into a single variable complex analysis problem by going to special kinematics. So we'll fix t to s minus k, where k is just some arbitrary integer, and uh, see what we get. So we'll input this into uh, the crossing uh, equation, and we'll kind of massage the sum a little bit so that we get uh, a finite sum on the right-hand side and an infinite sum that's a difference of two residues on the left-hand side. Yeah. Ah, well, okay. So none yet because I haven't told you what S is, right? Um, all, all I'm doing is I'm... I'm, I'm pinning T to S minus K. The reason I'm doing that though, is because uh, I'm going to be extracting some poles and I want to relate different poles. So the reason I'm choosing S minus K is because on the nth pole, I want T to be sensitive to a different pole so that I get this sort of uh, recursion relation. If I had chosen a different spectrum, in fact, later on when we do Q deformed integers, this will be different. But if I had chosen a different spectrum, I would have wanted to choose T such that I, I just shift to another pole. That's, it, it's a pole skipping type of thing. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Sorry? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm assuming that, uh, that the UV has some uh, small coupling. And so this is effectively just the tree level amplitude and there will be higher, higher order terms that I'm dropping. Um, yeah. 
that's a, it, it's a non-trivial assumption, but you know, it's it's what's true for the Veneziano amplitude. So we just want to see other other tree level amplitudes like Veneziano that do all the same things. Good. All right. So we have this uh, we have this constraint, and so now we want to see what uh, what it takes to satisfy it. So we notice that there are a finite number of terms on the right hand side, uh, and that there are no poles at uh, integer s uh, less than or equal to k. So we just want to impose the same thing of, of the right hand side. So demanding that uh, gives us this beautiful uh, constraint on the residue polynomials that the nth residue uh, evaluated at n minus k equals the n minus kth residue evaluated at n for k between one and n. So that's really nice. Uh, but this is strictly speaking a clossing inspired constraint. Uh, it's not strictly speaking necessary nor sufficient. Uh, and the reason is easy to see. Um, it's not sufficient because we, again, chose special kinematics. So you could imagine uh, if, if nature is sort of conspiring against us here, that it could be possible to uh, satisfy crossing on these special kinematics, but not away from it. Uh, it's also not a necessary requirement because, again, the this, repre oops, this representation of the amplitude in terms of an infinite sum, uh, this side converges for t uh, below threshold for t less than m naught squared, or it also converges in, in the sense of providing the right residues on all the S channel poles and vice versa for, uh, for the crossing symmetric uh, image. Now, when we plug in these special kinematics, this is not at generic t, we're at integer t. So you could worry about convergence. Nonetheless, we will find uh, sort of in post that everything we've done here is justified. We will in fact be able to use this constraint to find crossing symmetric amplitudes that are fully convergent and dual resonant. So we'll just take this as given and see what we get. Right, so we have n conditions. Uh, if you just do the parameter counting, we have n conditions. Uh, on the n plus one free parameters in the ansatz. So let me just solve that for you. Uh, I'll define lambda m as the lambda m comma m coefficient here. Uh, also everywhere I'll write factorials uh, extended to complex numbers. So rather than write a bunch of gamma functions, I'll just write, I'll just pretend uh, factorials are uh, functions of complex numbers. And we have the general solution here. So we have still an infinite number of free parameters, one uh, for each, uh, each index here. And we find numerically that if you choose the lambda m's, this real sequence, such that uh, the S channel representation converges, that always yields a dual resonant crossing symmetric amplitude. So we have already an infinite parameter generalization of Veneziano. Now, most numerical choices you would make for the lambda m's don't converge into anything that you can write down analytically. So let's explore this space a little bit and see if we can write down some beautiful analytic structures. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, lambda m has to fall off uh, as of order one over m factorial in order to converge. Um, but such things as you know, a polynomial in m over m factorial also, also works, yeah. So in fact, inspired by that, uh, let's just choose the simplest uh, case that converges. Uh, let's pick lambda m equals one over m factorial. So then we can use the Vandermond identity to rewrite uh, this residue very nicely as just t plus n factorial over t factorial n factorial. So that's a very simple uh, polynomial. And so we can rewrite the amplitude. We can plug in this uh, residue. And we can use a few identities. We'll use the definition of the pa commer symbol, which is just a ratio of gamma functions. And uh, we'll use the definition of the hypergeometric function. And finally, uh, we'll use uh, an identity called uh, Gauss's summation theorem to find that this is indeed just uh, the Veneziano amplitude. So we've derived uh, the Veneziano amplitude really simply just from a few physical constraints well, well posedness of the amplitude in the UV uh, crossing and a very simple choice of the, of the free parameters and it falls out naturally. So we now understand in a sense why the gamma gamma over gamma structure was natural. Now I said that uh, in order for this to converge we want lambda m to fall off as roughly one over m factorial. So 
a nice way of parameterizing that would be to shift the factorial in the denominator or equivalently multiply by some polynomial in M in the numerator and sort of take that as a basis and see what's the more general set of objects. So let's do that. Let's choose a, a, a nice basis for a generalization. Uh, we'll write lambda M as R factorial over M plus R factorial. Here R is an arbitrary real number. And again, the residue uh, has this nice closed form. And what we're now going to use is uh, the definition of the generalized hypergeometric function, uh, which is again, just an infinite sum over a bunch of uh, ratios of Pockhammer symbols to rewrite uh, our amplitude in terms of uh, 3F2. Now, the whole point of this was to build a crossing symmetric amplitude. This doesn't look obviously crossing symmetric. So now we're going to use uh, an identity on the 3F2 uh, due to a 19th century German mathematician named Tomé. And we can rewrite uh, this amplitude for this choice of lambda as just Veneziano times this dressing factor, uh, which is manifestly uh, crossing symmetric. So here, uh, again, this is a manifestly crossing symmetric dual resonant amplitude. So in a sense, this object is just as compelling as what Veneziano wrote in 1968. And so we should study this to death and see uh, what, what its properties are. Yeah. Yes, we are going to check that uh, shortly. In fact, positivity of the partial waves isn't you know, manifest at the level of the Veneziano amplitude. Uh, one has to check that it's positive. Uh, it was just proven without using no ghost theorems and string theory, just proven at the level of the amplitude uh, in dimensions up to six by Nima and company um, about a year and a half ago. Yeah. yeah, so we're going to check that. So in fact, that's the next thing. Uh, so we're, we're going to read off the residues. Uh, eventually we'll be more general, but just as a warm up, let's do this in four dimensions for massless external particles. So we're just going to take these uh, residue polynomials, write them as sums of Legendre's uh, in terms of the scattering angle and demand that all the A coefficients are positive. Because what those are, are effectively the uh, squares of the couplings between two of the light states and one exchanged state. So let's do this. You can uh, compute the uh, partial wave coefficients uh, explicitly in terms of uh, sums. Now, these aren't manifestly positive. They're alternating sums, just like for Veneziano. Uh, and these uh, here, S1 is a Sterling number. So here's what we get. We find uh, indeed for R, uh, this is covered up for some reason, for R equals zero, uh, this is just Veneziano and everything's positive as we expect. But for other values of R, so here's R equals one, R equals two, R equals three, uh, it remains positive. Uh, so indeed, uh, partial wave unitarity is, is satisfied at least for, for some range of R's. And we can, we'll explore that more generally uh, later, but just as a sanity check, indeed, this has, has a shot at being a real physical theory. Oh, R is, this, uh, is the one parameter extension. So this is a one parameter generalization of Veneziano. Uh, when R equals zero, this 3F2 becomes one and it reduces to Veneziano. Um, R need not be an integer. This has a particularly simple form when R is an integer because of hypergeometric identities, but yeah. It can a priori be positive or negative. Um, okay, as a spoiler, it turns out there is a lower bound on R that depends on dimension, uh, so it can't be too negative. Uh, but positive R is always fine. Good. Okay. No, no, this is <laughs> this is uh, this is numerical evidence. Yeah. Um, we can analytically understand some of these bounds by reading off, you know, and looking at the partial waves for the leading Reggie trajectory or the first or second subleading one, but uh, those are necessary conditions to understand why it's sufficient just requires checking a large number of partial waves. Ah, what does this mean physically? We don't, we don't know for sure, but I will show you a very suggestive idea that as, uh, uh, in terms of what it could mean. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, in, in the high energy fixed angle limit, we should also ask whether this uh, amplitude is well-behaved in the UV, whether it falls off nicely. String amplitudes, of course, are famously well-behaved in the UV. So for high energy fixed angle scattering, uh, we get the following scaling. We get this E to the B factor, where this B is the same object that shows up uh, for Veneziano, plus some term uh, that goes like a power law. 
So in the physical region, uh, one has B is uh, one has negative B, and so the amplitude falls off as a power law, uh, R over ST. Except in the R equals zero case, where you get the famous exponential fall off of strings. So it, it doesn't fall off exponentially like Veneziano, but it behaves more like a field theory in that it has power law uh, decay. In the unphysical region where T is positive, uh, B is positive, and so the high energy uh, scaling of the amplitude is just dominated by this E to the B factor, which was in fact uh, proven that, uh, that there had to be this sort of asymptotic uniqueness of Veneziano, uh, proven by uh, Karen Hulo, Komargatsky, Sever, and Javoidev uh, in 2016. So this agrees with their uh, uniqueness result. What about the Reggie limit? So high, high S fixed T. We know that this will be fine because we actually input it at the very beginning of the talk by construction, but let's just check. Uh, indeed, uh, we get uh, S to the T dominating for positive T. Uh, for negative T, we get again, power law uh, behavior. So this has the expected uh, Reggie scaling. Now uh, to get uh, back to uh, Tony's question, uh, it looks like there might be a world sheet interpretation of this amplitude. So remarkably, uh, our three F2 hypergeometric amplitude can be rewritten um, in terms of an integral representation as a double integral uh, in terms of two uh, dummy parameters, X and Y. And this reminded us of the Koba Nielsen form uh, for the four point Veneziano amplitude, which uh, is a, of course a single integral. And in fact, if you look at the five point Koba Nielsen uh, string amplitude, so five point Veneziano, and then fix special kinematics, so pin some of the SIJs uh, to just fixed numbers, minus one, minus R, minus one, you get back precisely our 3F2 amplitude. So it's as though our hypergeometric amplitude might be obtained from taking the five point string and doing something to it. What that something corresponds to, we don't know. We just know that formally it corresponds to fixing some of the uh, SIJs. So that's the best interpretation we have right now of the underlying physical degrees of freedom, but it's a very interesting open question. Right, so uh, time's getting on. So now I want to jump to uh, another choice of spectrum. So we've looked at the integers. I now wanna look at the Q-deformed integers. And the reason is because historically, uh, you know, of course, string amplitudes predate the realization that the theory was about strings. And so it's worthwhile uh, exploring new amplitudes that can lead to new physics. And this was done uh, in 1969, one year after Veneziano by Daryl Kuhn, uh, and then tragically forgotten for decades. This is the uh, Inspire graph, and you can see it's just a flat line pretty much until uh, the last year or so when there's been a surge of interest. Uh, and what he did is he essentially Q deformed uh, the Veneziano amplitude. In mathematics, there's this whole field of Q deforming everything in sight. And it, it starts with Q deforming the integers. So let's assume uh, our M squareds are the Q deformed integers. So the nth Q deformed integer is just one plus N plus N squared all the way up to, uh, uh, excuse me, one plus Q plus Q squared all the way up to Q to the N minus one. So when Q goes to one, you just reduce to N. Uh, and for Q less than one, you have some accumulation point uh, in the spectrum. So uh, starting from that point and defining some new kinematic variables, sigma and tau, we can write down a dual resonant ansatz. Uh, that's a, essentially a Q deformation of what we wrote before. And we can go to special kinematics. So now rather than T equals S minus K, we'll choose tau equals sigma minus K. So the suitable Q deformed version. So the T uh, shifts to the uh, shifted pole. And again, imposing crossing and running through uh, the whole uh, exercise that we did before, we have some general solution for the residues. So now we, we still have additional freedom. We can dress each term in the sum with a prefactor uh, that goes to one on the pole. And doing that won't change any of the residues. So we're going to do that uh, with benefit of hindsight. So we'll choose to dress each term with a factor of Q to the tau times sigma minus N. And doing that and choosing uh, a simple Q deformed version of uh, one over M factorial for the free constants yields a dual resonant crossing symmetric amplitude whose uh, S channel sum converges. And it's precisely the Kuhn amplitude. And you can see it's just the Q deformation of uh, Veneziano dressed with some uh, branch cut factors. Good. So we understand where the Kuhn amplitude comes from. And uh, I'll just 
plot view, the true Frouchy plot for people who haven't seen this. Uh, so the community amplitude has uh, these accumulation points uh, depending on the value of, of Q. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as a logarithmic deformation of the Reggie trajectory. All right, so we now understand where that comes from, uh, sort of building it from the ground up. And I should add, this is not how Kuhn derived his amplitude. He derived it on purely aesthetic grounds. He wanted to write down an amplitude that had some infinite product uh, representation, but instead we've seen it's, it's just something that naturally falls out if you want any dual resonant amplitude that has uh, the Q-deformed integers as its spectrum. All right, um, at high energies, uh, the Kuhn amplitude has this funny double log uh, that I, I also found uh, amplitudes that have that double log in some recent work with Juan Maldacena, uh, we, we built some string theory constructions uh, where you have open strings attached to D brains and ADS that have exactly this double log. So this is uh, physically healthy. And the branch cuts that appear in the Kuhn amplitude suggest uh, a sort of ionization process. Uh, recent work by uh, Christian Ibsen, who's here, uh, has shown an apparent breakdown of unitarity in the Kuhn amplitude uh, exponentially near uh, the branch point, even though uh, the partial waves on all the poles are unitary. So that could possibly be cured by choosing a different uh, prefactor. That's an, an open question uh, that people are working on. Uh, I just mean that you have. All right, so you have some uh, poles that march toward an accumulation point, and then above that point, you have you have logs, you have branch cuts, which suggest you know some multi-particle state. Yeah, exactly. It's not known whether it's truly a continuum because it, there's not a fundamental description of uh, of what's going on. Yeah, it's it's purely suggestive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So in fact, I. Right, so let me let me go back. Um, the residues here are just polynomials in T. The onsots is indeed a purely tree level onsots. So where on earth did the branch cuts come from? The branch cuts came, remember sigma and tau have log S and log T in them. So the branch cuts came from this dressing factor, this Q to the tau, uh, Q to the sigma tau dressing factor that I added. Now I added that by hand because you can just verify that if you don't add this factor, which goes to one on all the poles, if you don't add it, this uh, amplitude doesn't converge. This infinite sum uh, just blows up. And, but, but this same dressing factor occurred in Kuhn's construction, which involved an infinite product. And there, uh, the, the reason for existence of this factor was to turn um, a polynomial in one over T into a polynomial in T. By, by having a, a Q to the log S log T factor. So, you know, this is one example of a dressing factor, but I can in principle add any contact terms I like. And, uh, you know, this is, this is something that Christian has been uh, exploring. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so the reason I'm doing this is because we're, we're trying to make contact with, with the Kuhn amplitude. Um, so we started out by asking, is there uh, a way of building a tree level amplitude with Q deformed integers uh, and, and that's dual resonant? The answer is no, unless you add these uh, dressing factors. And the cost of adding them is introducing logs. And that seems sort of inevitable. Uh, it, it, and it might not be so strange physically because, uh, like I said, you can kind of wave your hands about ionization processes, but no one really knows. Yeah, they start at the accumulation point and go go off. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's. I mean, that, yeah. That's exactly what what we found. Yeah. Yeah, but but again, I stress the, the constructions that Juan and I looked at, they captured various constructions involving D brains and ADS captured various aspects of the Kuhn amplitude. There was no single construction that completely got at the Kuhn amplitude, but it's conceivable that some slightly more complicated version will. Right, uh, so now what I wanna do is ask whether the Kuhn amplitude can itself be generalized and can I connect this back with the hypergeometric amplitudes uh, at the beginning of the talk. So we'll consider a slightly more general choice for the lambda m's. Again, it's something that sort of falls off like one over m factorial suitably Q deformed. 
And we can run through the same sort of exercise and use a what's called a Q Tommy Kummer Whipple transformation. Uh, and we have a new class of crossing symmetric dual resonant amplitudes. So this is a Q hypergeometric amplitude. The three phi two is the Q hypergeometric function. And you can see it's the Kuhn amplitude dressed with uh, some uh, kinematics. Yeah. No, no, this is, uh, th th this is just a number, right? Uh, so the dressing factor occurs here. I'm assuming, I'm assuming here the same dressing factor as, uh, as for Kuhn. So this is the dressing factor. This contains the branch cuts. But you, I could write down anything here that goes to one on the pole, and it would be safe. This is, in a sense, the simplest thing that, that does the job. No, that is, well, that is done with benefit of hindsight. So, uh, all right, so the, the lambda m's that we chose to get the Kuhn amplitude were the following. These turn into just one over m factorial when q goes to one. Uh, but this uh, q to the stuff was chosen so that we get these nice uh, q gamma functions. And then uh, the adding the shift here was done so that we get this nice uh, q uh, hypergeometric function. Uh, in principle, yes, you could play around with all sorts of alternative choices for the lambda m's. This was the only one that we found that's particularly nice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Good. So uh, I want to stress this object uh, unifies everything I've written down uh, in the whole rest of the talk. So uh, this uh, Q hypergeometric amplitude fills out this whole green plane. Oh, there should be an R there. So, uh, right. So Q equals one arbitrary R are the hypergeometric amplitudes we looked at previously. R equals zero arbitrary Q is the Kuhn amplitude. The Veneziano amplitude sits at this point and we've now filled out uh, the whole space. So we can indeed look at partial wave unitarity. Here, I won't look at uh, unitarity on the branch cuts because that's uh, an open problem, but just looking at partial wave unitarity here, uh, we can now generalize what I wrote down earlier and even shift the spectrum uh, with an arbitrary M naught squared. So an arbitrary starting point for the tower. And we see some special points. So here, uh, everything uh, in, in teal is, is okay from the point of view of unitarity. Every, and each line here is a particular dimension. So this is four dimensions, five dimensions, 10 dimensions, and 26 dimensions. So here, uh, for 26 dimensions, uh, the bosonic string sits at this corner of the allowed uh, unitary parameter space. In 10 dimensions, the superstring sits here at this red dot. And in five dimensions, there's this interesting point with non-zero R. So this is a hypergeometric amplitude with uh, exactly critical dimension five and R equals minus a half. And that's an interesting uh, theory. It's compelling from the point of view of unitarity. So we'd like to understand that special case uh, in more detail. Here, if I fix M naught squared to zero and I float Q, uh, we again have different regions uh, where this is unitary. Uh, in dark teal, it's unitary in all dimensions. And uh, above this line, it's unitary in four, five, 10, and 26 uh, dimensions, respectively. So I could put those together and show you a full three-dimensional plot. So here we have uh, four, 10, and 26 dimensions. And this, uh, this wedge extrudes to arbitrarily large R, it appears. Um, arbitrarily large R is, is okay. We, we haven't looked at that yet. So in principle, uh, uh, Jepsen's interesting paper uh, on the Kuhn amplitude should be generalized to the branch points. Um, computing uh, and checking partial wave unitarity on the branch cut is technically harder than just doing it on the on the poles. And so that's something that uh, that should be done. It hasn't been done yet. Well, yeah, so so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave discussion of this for for Christian's talk, but essentially he, he took uh, T derivatives in the forward limit and uh, to rule out Q near one, he had to take higher and higher T derivatives. Uh, so to ex explore the full space of uh, Q from zero to one would require um, actually a lot of computation. But uh, I wanna also stress though, remember we also have these uh, hypergeometric amplitudes in the Q goes to one case where we understand unitarity you know, more completely there where there are no branch points and it's just a bunch of poles.
All right, so just to, to recap, um, I mentioned, uh, but I, I should mention it here, that we have some physical interpretation perhaps of the Kuhn amplitude in the sense that uh, we found some string backgrounds that capture various aspects of, of Kuhn. So that is, if you take an open string, uh, fix it to a D brain at fixed bulk depth in ADS. And if you spin it, uh, you get an accumulation point in angular momentum, just like the Kuhn amplitude has. But it approaches the accumulation point as a power law, not exponentially. So it's not quite Kuhn. If instead, if you stretch it, uh, it approaches the accumulation point exponentially, but not in terms of spin, it just in terms of this semi-classical uh, quantum number N. Um, Finally, if you take two of these strings and you collide them and scatter them, uh, then at very high energies, uh, you indeed get the, the double log uh, structure that the Kuhn amplitude has. So it's conceivable that some combination of all three of those processes uh, would exactly get the Kuhn amplitude, but that's, uh, that's an open question. But what's interesting is, you know, we wouldn't have looked at this if not for the Kuhn amplitude. So these bootstrap constructions can point the way toward the exploration of new structures within string theory itself. And uh, just to remind you what we've done, we've derived this new infinite parameter family of amplitudes that are Lorentz invariant, crossing symmetric, have polynomial residues, and remarkably uh, satisfy UV boundedness and their dual resonance, just like uh, string theory. And for particular choices, we get these beautiful hypergeometric uh, structures, uh, everything in sight, Q deforms very nicely, and it appears to be uh, unitary. And so we're, well, it, yeah, yeah, it, it appears to be, it appears to satisfy, par, it satisfies partial wave unitarity. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Numerical expiration indicates consistency with partial wave unitarity, right. Um, so right now we're looking at uh, all sorts of other interesting directions. Uh, we're pursuing the dual resonance bootstrap for amplitudes with different mass spectra. Uh, I can tell you right now, we actually found a way to build a, uh, endpoint amplitudes, so arbitrary, arbitrary endpoint uh, that have a world sheet representation with arbitrary spectrum for the first uh, n masses, and then that, that asymptotes to Reggie. Uh, we end up using some Galois theory. I can tell you more about it in, in the coffee break, but as an example, we can write down string-like amplitudes at endpoints that have a KK spectrum at low energies and that asymptote to Reggie. So these are, are very exciting. They look totally different than everything I've written down uh, here, but uh, yeah, ask me about that offline. But uh, again, we're interested in figuring out what's the underlying physical system giving rise to all these new amplitudes. And uh, hopefully eventually we would like to prove that either all these new objects might be somehow secretly sick, or maybe they turn out to exist in string theory itself and illuminate some corner of the theory we haven't explored. Uh, ultimately, this is essentially the only path to proving uniqueness of string theory. So it's, it's a worthy goal, I think. Uh, so thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, so we've, we've thought about doing that. Okay, I mean, part of the problem is we're getting a lot of mileage out of the assumption of UV boundedness, right? That's what allows us to assume to, to get dual resonance. We could, in principle, drop the UV boundedness assumption, but then we might have to put in more by hand in order to have a tractable problem. So we might have to drop UV boundedness, but put in dual resonance as an assumption. And then maybe maybe there's more that you could do. Yeah, that's an option. Yep. Really interesting. Uh, I'm um, wondering about the trying to think back on the Higgs period. I wasn't there at the time to do that in, in physics, but uh, uh, I have the impression that the structure for in, in some level different more three modes that classified the universe. But then there was a problem when you do loop love that Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, to, to do loops, it would be desirable to have, have a, an understanding of the fundamental degrees of freedom. Um, for what we're doing, 
with our, our new project, um, loops might be possible because again, we have uh, world sheet representations of the amplitude at endpoint, which would be something necessary in order to do loops. So we might be able to do loops with this new stuff. But um, the other comment I would have is that indeed, while the critical dimension, you, while you see it at loop level, in string theory, somehow the tree level amplitudes also kind of know about the critical dimension in the sense that you can also read off the critical dimension as the maximal dimension where partial wave unitarity is satisfied. So you can read off D equals 10 and D equals 26 purely from unitarity at tree level. So it's, we're, we're hopeful that that ports over to any of these new models, but yeah. No, uh, so, so uh, in the, let me see. Yeah, so, so it, it goes like, you know, S to the, S to the T, the Reggie uh, behavior, but then there's a uh, plus one over something that looks like order S times T. So there are power law corrections uh, for non-zero R. No, there'll be one over S squared, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, I, we just dropped all those, yeah. Thanks. Uh, again. Yes. 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 Yes.